Okay, so perhaps a final video about simulating board game stuff in Google Spreadsheets and Google Scripting with Google Scripting. I'm going to show you a bit of the architecture I put up in uh, uh, simulating the game I'm making. Um, I'm just going to go you, uh, give you a very brief uh, show on what the game looks like and what, what it does. We have adventurers, characters, um, well each player has a character sheet and it's a cooperative game. You have here uh, skills that players level up. That's an important part of the game because you want to be powerful enough uh, to face the evil sorceress at the end of the game. Another important thing here is, let's see if I can enlarge this. No, maybe not. Ugh. Sorry. Um, so here we have um, boxes that you tick when you encounter the uh, spell of command from the evil sorceress. And this takes down the in-game time, which is also an important part of, of keeping track of, uh, or an important thing to keep track of in, in the game. You have hit points, you have mana points, and also kind of important. We have um, items, uh, not least weapons that you can find or buy, which is uh, also important uh, because it affects how good you are at fighting, which is a, one of the important parts of the game. Uh, all right, that's something. We also have, this is the game board-ish. Uh, and we have here uh, starting place, and you can move through this uh, uh, through this board uh, to different places. You have here special locations where you can do special stuff. Uh, not least um, have a good chance of leveling up uh, your skills. Uh, and you can see there are some borders here which you cannot pass through, which means going from the home village to the soldier school is a path going roughly, well, this way, I guess. Um, all right, a few more things. Uh, when you move in the game, you have three dice, three d6 roll, and the number of equal dice is the number you're allowed to move. So if you roll one, four, four, you can go two steps because you have a pair. If you want roll one, two, five, uh, you can only go one step because you don't have more than one equal of, of any results. Um, right. Let's see if I can show you some of the stuff I did to simulate this. I have here, um, let's start with just character data because it's kind of an uh, easy way to start. You have the knight and the warrior, the ranger, written in Swedish because I do playtesting in Swedish, so half of this stuff is in Swedish, sorry about that. Um, the different stats, uh, some starting item, uh, for these uh, characters. And here also this place, uh, place location where they start. And it could be, uh, sometimes I use a guided way for, for the uh, characters to move. Then I put all, well, a, long, a list of places here. Um, I have here a list of all the places in the, on the board. So this is one, 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 two, one, three, this is, Five one five two and so on, six one six two, and this list here says that um, place well space two two is in the woodlands, and the space four two is on the fields, and you get into the marsh and wherever, and that affects where you draw adventure cards. Let's have a look at those as well. Well, let's first actually look at the paths. Here is. Uh, a list of paths you can take if you want to go from the home village to the magical university, for example. You have the list of spaces you move here. That's data I put into this simulation, just hard coded it, well, put it into this um, yeah, spreadsheet stuff. And then over here we have the adventure cards. This is the woodland cards. This is appears to be filtered, yeah. So we have well, cards for the hills, the city, the fields, the mountains, and so on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and we have items. So let's have a look at these cards again, sorry. 
I have the name of the cards, the, the area for the cards, the regions where they, are, where they are used, and some some of the important data on the cards. So uh, when you face enemies, I have the fight value and a flea value because that's used sometimes. I have, well, actually, the most important thing is probably over here eventually. Uh, what kind of script is called to resolve these kind of cards? Uh, well, each card here, and we'll get into these those details later on. Items as well, uh, just with some of the basic stuff here, ba uh, basic data and stuff. Uh, the name, uh, the type of item, most important here. I think the only thing I'm sim using in the simulation is weapons, range weapon and uh, close combat weapons price and whether the one-handed or two-handed and give some bonus we're going to go into some details details of that i guess okay so this is data i put fed into this simulation and let's have a look at what this simulation does then and this is my third version of simulating this game first was very basic just simulating card drawing not not much else and seeing how often the the spell of command was drawn second version was uh, more more of simulating the full game but i eventually abandoned it to make a better architecture for the third version which i'm going to talk about now so i have some global variables which i use uh, uh, make them available across the full script Globals are not good in general, but this is a well, limited project, so why not? Um, and then the actual simulation starts here by building up some global data and setting up the game. So in this file, breaking things up into files was very good. This simulation main, main script is well 300 something lines. And it would have been a few thousand lines, I guess, if everything was in the same file and would have been very difficult to navigate uh, eventually. So setting up data is separated out to a different file. And this then reads stuff from the spreadsheet and also has some hard coded data. So here is some settings used for logging stuff. We have, well, uh, statistics stuff saying we have a list of locations that look like this which is used then later on to see is a, a character at a special location or at a regular space things like that we have a list of well stuff building the uh right here's well let's have a, a mention this a bit it reads uh, data from the cards here and i in the when building this, I specify that we have we read the property deck name from column one. This is here. We read um, if any special traits are used from column 11, which is somewhere here, I guess. Yeah. Things like that. So I, I control stuff from, from the script, reading from the, uh, from the spreadsheet. And this then builds the, all the data that is necessary to start the simulation up here. And this is stored in um, initial uh, game state. Um, so I have that to, I read it and create it once and then loop through stuff later on and, and make copies of this initial game state for every game I'm, I'm uh, simulating. Uh, so, what happens then we're looping through the game i here we have the start of the loop uh, going from one to the number of iterations which which is set to some default i think is one if i don't specify anything um, and i have also a big 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 array called results where i at the end of each iteration push the data i want to keep into this array and then can make statistics on it, run some statistics on it. The per game st uh, statistics is stored, well, eventually stored in, in a variable called stats. And then make copy of stuff. 
that we want to use in this particular game. Da, 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 da. And then the game almost starts. In, uh, before starting, the, the players may buy stuff. So I have separate, separated out this into functions called consider buy. That's kind of strange. Or maybe not. OK. Um, and then play through the game. So I have uh, a helper function saying, uh, are we at the end of the game? If, if so, abort or finish this loop. Otherwise, just keep going, adding days. And the runs are called days. And then go roll and move. And let's actually go into here. One of the important things, all useful things, uh, I, I decided to go object oriented for this simulation, or this version 3, which was very nice. I have here uh, a class called dice which I just call and it rolls the dice. It checks if I have uh, how many uh, equals I have in the dice. I check the sum, I make skill rolls, I make re-rolls. I check if I have uh, a straight with the dice because that get, you know, gives some bonus in the game, things like that. If I have three of a kind, I might level up as well. Uh, so that's well all taken care of in this uh, class here, which is called when needed. More interestingly, I think, is the characters object, the character class. It has a lot of things in here. So, and and that has been really helpful, separating, all, separating out all these things into the character class that uh, I, I can call, well, it's built up from data from the spreadsheet. And I have functions like, um, as well, increasing or decreasing stats, uh, ch uh, changing hit points. So I can log stuff uh, on this character object. I can say, well, it has in total lost 15 hit points throughout the game or gained uh, 12 hit points in total, things like that. Um, let's see. Give me, give me, give me something that depends on that depends on the uh, strategy used. Yeah, OK. So here's something. Uh, in the game, you can uh, decide if, well, you can spend, called, it's called flux crystals. It's the currency of the game, but, but it's also some kind of magic crystals that allows you to alter the, the flow of things in the world, which means uh, sacrifice a, a crystal and you can re-roll a die, or sacrifice six crystals and you can re-roll. Uh, you can choose the outcome of a die instead of re-rolling it. So, if you roll three of a kind and it's a high enough uh, triplet, uh, you can level up uh, when you either when you move or when you use the uh, the skill, and that's. Um, is a pretty important part of the game that when you m move or roll for movement and you get, a, say, a pair of sixes, you might want to uh, pay six cri uh, flux crystals and level up, uh, change the final die to a six and then level up in, in the skill that you want to uh, level up in. But characters might want to do that in different ways, and I didn't want to hard code that strategy into the uh, character object. So this is separated out into strategies. And you can see here, uh, when deciding or considering to pay to level up during movement, uh, it's calling another function from a strategies object, uh, checking which strategy this uh, character is using, and then calling the function pay to level up movement in that part of the strategy. We can see, I think everyone is using the, yeah, the default strategy right now. So this will call uh, the default strategy, which is the biggest one, which has a lot of things going on here, like uh, saying how vulnerable the character is might differ on, on different characters or how you play or how, you, how offensively you want to play or how safe you want to play. Um, saying how different it is, how important it is to level up different skills. We have somewhere here, 
pay to level up in movement. So this function is called to see how important is it to level up, how many flux crystals do I have, is it worth leveling up, things like that, and which skill is most important to level up. Which has been, well, uh, a useful strategy or useful architecture, I think, because then I could, and I have, created spin-offs of this uh, default strategy. So I say, here's a, a well, an alteration of the default strategy, I copy it, and I replace some part of this strategy. So I inherit everything from the default strategy except the things I want to overwrite. So I can make pretty small strategies uh, added on top of this default strategy. Uh, all right, character object, very important. And I think this uh, way of separating out strategies has been really good well, or really useful to, to make things work. Um, well, roll and move, draw and resolve cards, which is, well, was a bit of a hassle because if several uh, characters is on the same space on the board, they share an adventure card. So we pick a card and then what's ha what is happening depends on how many players are on that space. Uh, on the board and they decide how to share this card between them who should fight this ogre well we pick the one with the uh, highest uh, well best at fighting if that person is not too weak because then someone else should start fighting and see if he or she wins uh, so that's kind of a hassle but it turned out well eventually um, and here let's see card resolvers Somewhere around here we have, yeah, we check the, uh, the resolver for the card. You might remember I went on the map talking about this resolver column. So we have fights, we have ghosts, we have valuable finds, we have someone offering to buy items, someone giving an opportunity for training, things like that. These are found in the card resolver column. Uh, file. So we have the command spell resolver, wah, the dreaded. We have, well, something for shuffling. This is how fights are made, things happening, how ghosts are resolved, how valuable findings are resolved, and then down here a lot of things not yet implemented. The important things are implemented, the rest I've Waited with, and that's all right. Um, and I'm happy I have an architecture that allows adding more stuff without rewriting. So I could, uh, I don't know, add something here. This is a card allowing looking at the top cards and deciding if you want to uh, reshuffle a deck. I could add that resolver as well without having to change any existing uh, code. All right. And then we have the special places, which is also kind of interesting. Um, I think we have, yeah, location resolvers. Not most of the things important, most of the interesting things at uh, special locations is training which I think is uh, done by a, s a function called in here, uh, not by the location resolvers. Um, but then eventually, let's see. Yeah. yeah, and some interesting things happen here. Um, let's talk about healing later on. Before that, let's talk about selecting destination. That was a pretty tricky one. Because um, players start in the home village, usually they want to go somewhere and you have quests uh, on each location that allows you to, well, gives you a bonus when you reach another location. But there's only one card for each uh, pair of locations or each directed pair of locations. So going from hometown to the Sword Masters uh, Academy gives you three uh, flux crystals, but only if you have this single card with that quest. So when someone has taken that, 
the next player probably wants to go to the magical university or the soldier school so this um, I took out into a separate function and well it's called from from the character object but it's in the strategy so we have something here called select location I guess Okay, so when you're in, we have cool on location. Location. Oh, never mind. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the one I get. Set destination. Here it is. Uh, so this could be done in a lot of different ways. The things, uh, the way I eventually ended up implementing it, I tried a few was just giving points to different locations. So first I have some, some uh, well, zero cases that if, if this or that is fulfilled, then the, um, then the character should go to, uh, to the evil sorceress's tower. Otherwise, give points to the different locations and see which location has the highest points. H having um, uh, having a quest card, for example, that, uh, for, a, for a location uh, gives higher probability for the player to go there. Uh, having some, something useful to train, a sk useful skill to train at a location uh, also increases uh, the likelihood of going there. Things like that. That's one way of doing, well, I guess, an, some kind of AI thingy. So it's what, well, point-based. Compare that to the way of paying for healing. Uh, healing. Well, yeah, let's look at this. Um, the characters have hit points and mana points, and they could pay to heal. Uh, they could, well, at these locations, say the Magical University, pay one flux, flux crystal and you get two mana points, zero hit points. At the Swordmasters, uh, Swordmasters Academy, pay one flux crystal, get one of each, one hit point, one mana point. Same thing in Home Village, and here we get two hit points, zero mana points. I create, eventually I created this matrix, uh, which is, I think it's, yeah, health points on the x-axis and mana points on the y-axis. So a character who has one hit point and one mana point would be here at minus four. And then if you, well, this script then compares if you heal two hit points, you would end up at minus 2.2. And the difference between these two is, uh, well, the value used to, to determine if it's worth paying one flix crystal to, to uh, uh, heal in one way or another. Uh, so that's another way of creating AI functionality or some kind of smart decision making. When it comes to selecting location, I used a point-based system. In this uh, case with healing, I instead used some kind of, I call it health potential, saying what kind of value or how well or ill uh, the or vulnerable the character is on a, some kind of scale. And this is implemented in the, a strategy object, so you could override it with other strategies uh, and having variations for, for each player. That's almost it. Training, yada yada. With also ability, well, a chance for paying to train. It costs to train for every flux crystal you pay, you get uh, to roll three die dice uh, so if you pay four flux crystals you get to pay you can roll 12 dice and hope for a triplet that is high enough which was kind of complex but not really interesting to talk about right now um yeah and then when the this loop is done and uh, the players say well the script decides that the players are done i only simulate the way up to uh, the Tower of the Evil Sorceress, not the actual end fight, the final battle. Uh, 
some st uh, statistics are calculated. So first we, well, a loop ca calculates the honor and glory that the characters receive, which is an important part of, of finding data for this game. And then a lot of things just added here, things I felt I wanted to look at, like how many uh, spell of command does each uh, player have in, well, has been subjected to on average, what's the minimum amount, the maximum amount, because that was important to decide how many uh, boxes to have on, on the uh, character sheet. Uh, how often has a uh, character passed out, got, gotten zero uh, health points? We don't want to have that too much because it will ruin the game experience. Things like that, just adding stuff up in this st stats object so we can store them and log them. Eventually just uh, spitting out data and displaying it. Hep. So we get something like this, I guess. Now it's running 200 games in front of our eyes, which is kind of quicker than having playtesters doing it. All right, so here we have, well, distribution. We, we can see, well, it's actually the same data as we have here. Yeah, so I can get, see that if these players, right now I think it's four, yeah, these four characters play by the standard uh, strategy in a long game, it's three different uh, lengths of games. We can see that they have been, well, the one with the most spell of command, well, on average, five point something goes from four to eight in the extreme cases. And this is a, uh, they play quickly with this uh, uh, default uh, strategy. If I change this to the strategy called hero then they wait until one has leveled up to become a hero uh, before going towards the evil sorceress and then we'll have much more uh, damage from the spell of command doom, 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 doom. and we can see it goes from six if you're lucky this is the fifth uh, percentile then you have six or seven spell of command at most for, for a character up to 14. And if you reach 14, you're doomed. And all the players are teleported to the uh, to the evil sorceress. The one with the minimum, uh, or at least um, number of spell of command has, has this instead. Which is good. This this means that players will be stressed out. You, uh, if you play for uh, with this strategy, you will on average get about 10 uh, spell of commands on you. And I've used that to, to select the number of boxes here to make sure that this place will get stressed out. They cannot wait too long before going to the evil sorceress. All right, um, what else is there? Yeah, okay. So uh, some other things that this uh, simulation has allowed. I was using um, well, you can pay one flux crystal to re-roll a die. You can pay six to select the outcome. I was using pay five instead of six uh, and did some calculations. And I decided that I wanted to change to the cost to six. Let's see, save die cost, yeah. So by ch tweaking one number here, I can say we now have a cost of five for for uh, selecting the outcome of a die. And this will change the outcome of the game and get new numbers directly. It's kind of neat. Yeah, you can see here we have now pretty much less, well, five to 13 instead of one, or was it uh, something else a bit higher, maybe one higher. I could, if I like, which is uh, pretty weird, but change the number of sides on a die to five, you can get, well, let's not do that. That's just silly, but it's interesting. Uh, more interesting, I guess, is uh, things I experimented with. I'm not sure what to do with that, but for a quick game, I was thinking about making a smaller map. 
so the distance between uh, places are uh, smaller. And I made a separate list here uh, saying the name, well, uh, the coordinates for the spaces and which regions they belong to, and having another list of paths between uh, between these uh, special locations. And I think I have, I think I have, let's see, what's the name of the, small, yeah. So if I here select, I can run a short, medium or long game, but it can also run a small game. And then the, uh, the script picks these, uh, data for the smaller board, and I get data for this. Uh, right now, 150 games played, four players with the hero strategy, and they get on average minus seven hero and glory. Uh, honor and glory, sorry. All right, I think that's enough. This is more than half an hour of video. Um, yeah, and you can write uh, read in the blog post about more about my my uh, conclusions about working in this way. I think it's been very useful, it's fun, I like coding. You might uh, suspect that already. Um, but I think this really helps in game development, board game development, in, at, at least in the way I'm doing it. I don't want to overestimate the coding and simulation things. This is good for getting numbers, the quantitative stuff. Games is about experience. To get a good experience, it's often, at least for me, important that the game is well balanced and stuff like that. Uh, but you don't get a good game by just having good numbers. That's how, not how it works. But you certainly get a bad game, at least for me, if you have bad numbers in the game. So uh, useful, uh, but not enough. Thanks for listening so far. See you some other time. Bye.